Hey guys, welcome to Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. I'm Nerdarchus Ryan, and today I'm joined by Nerdarchus Dave, Nerdarchus Ted. And today we talk about the problem of perception. If you want to jump down to the description below, you can sign up for Nerdarchy the newsletter. It's a great way to get weekly gaming tips as well as learn how to game with us. So, what is the problem with perception? Right, so if you notice, most of your sort of scoutingly sort of characters, your rogues and your, your rangers and what have you, and really <laughs> the majority of players, because perception is the super skill, like it's the skill that most of the time matters. Um, so most players are going to look to be proficient in it. Like uh, in games I've run, I've noticed that uh, quite a bit. Um, and then also too, your scouting characters, their perception, passive perception is so high that literally there's no point in putting traps in your game because they're going to be spotted, right? Like, so as it is, what do you consider too high? Um, so the if you have a pa passive perception of 15 plus mm -hmm. by most things that are in any book that's been published as, as published adventures, um, the character automatically spots it. So, oh, so th there's a couple factors that you ca you have to make sure you're not ignoring as the GM. Mm. One, are they moving at half move? No, right. add five. Right. Um, are they using a light source? Yeah. The is um, not dark vision. Uh, and not on the outskirts of a torch or a lantern. No, add five. So th that's two important factors that have to be that I think gets ignored a lot. Yeah, of times. I I have definitely been uh, thinking about the disadvantage mechanic as well, um, especially if there's an encounter going on while they could be triggering that trap. I've also been thinking about that. But even so, like if the DC of a trap is a 14 and it goes mm. to a 19. If the character, depending on a super low party level party is less likely to see that, but a mid-level party, th again, that sort of scout character who has say expertise in, per in perception. Um, so your rogue that's optimized to do that sort of thing. Using passive perception by raw doesn't really work. For, for if you're basically, if you're putting something in to be a hindrance to the party, and it doesn't go off, it's not actually a hindrance, right? So, well, it, it depends upon what your point of putting those traps in. If you're putting those traps in because you want them to take the damage, well, then you can always bump those DCs to a level that's going to make it harder for them. If you feel, okay, well, I'm putting it in there so that there's an obstacle to, to, to be overcome, the players overcome it, Yay! They've done what you wanted. What what it was there for? Uh, to me, as the DM, if I'm putting traps in there, I'm not putting it in there because I want them to take damage. I'm putting it in there because it's an obstacle and it may go off. It might not. To me, it doesn't matter either way. Yeah. Well, I only find it interesting, really, for traps. Like, I think damage that players just take is usually just bullshit. Like, if it's just like for me, I'd rather have it be like, oh, this trap triggers, and then these these intelligent humanoids that are like 100 feet, mm -hmm. 150 feet, hear the trap go off, and so the trap has consequences. Yeah. Um, or, or, getting to exploit those type of things that are set up that that's definitely advantageous for an adversary right or or the idea that like a fight's going on the creature that occupies the place knows of the trap they're intelligent they're mm -hmm. sentient or whatever and um they're going to exploit the fact that they know where the trap is and the players might stumble into it which is going to hinder the fight and again make it more difficult make it have interesting sort of consequences right. for the players so I i've seen uh recently i saw a discussion i don't remember where but it was talking about uh you know investigation and, and perception in conjunction mm -hmm. with traps where per, you know perception or even you know an investigation type um scene the, the idea is you need perception to find the clues mm -hmm. and then you need investigation to find the mechanism to usually. tell you what that means yeah so the, the way i've been told the way um it's supposed to work is perception lets you find it investigation lets you know how to disarm it thieves tools allows you to disarm it it's a three-step process yeah, yeah so so you know the chance i mean you could be optimal at doing all of those things but your chances are you you know that that's a huge uh, investment well i mean that's why the rogue gets that's why a rogue gets so many skills but um that being said too 
once you investigate it and you know how the mechanism of the trap works, you don't necessarily have to disarm it. Like you're like, oh, just don't step on that flagstone and you're yeah. good. Um, so there, there could be the idea of you don't really have to disarm every trap you encounter. Um, some of them you may have to, but some yes. of them there might be like, oh, you see that tripwire? Just don't step on it and we're good. Well, that that's true, but then it leads to other problems like, oh, now you're running away from a monster. And you have to remember not to step on that tripwire. Oh, yeah, no, that, that becomes a very interesting complication. But adventurers, like, being murder hobos that, like, just kill things and take their stuff, I don't really see, like, long-sightedness being a, a key a trait, feature uh, of, of, of the kind of person that goes and, like, just kills things and takes their stuff. Because by that law, like, anything that has, like, relatives should be after adventurers. Yeah. When you think about it, everyone um, knows monsters don't have relatives. They don't have family. They're not they're, monsters. They're, aren't people. They're not loved. Yeah. Well, so Five E does incorporate some things. Maybe not for traps, but in general, like there's definitely ambush monsters that defeat per, per, your, all, dece all all perception. perception. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Other than. I would argue possibly some magical means. Right. Mm -hmm. so you've, got, you've got your animated armor, which mm -hmm. just looks like a statue. Uh, you've got piercers. Gargoyle. You've got gargoyles. You've got trend, dark mantles. Um, oh, no, the no, dark mantles don't have the appearance things. So, sorry. Yeah. Um, what was it? Chokers or cloakers or one of, the, one of those things kind of... Cloaker, yeah. Uh, and their cousins, the trousers. Trousers, yeah. You don't want the trousers. Yeah. <sighs> It gets ugly when you put those on. Yeah. So, but basically, things that could help you. So, you have the ambush monsters that literally a player, just in short of magical means, can't discern that they're there's something other than inanimate, inanimate object. Right. Um, we talked about the idea of definitely if the characters are moving at regular speed. <coughs> Or um, or distracted, like I'd say, a character in the throes of combat is distracted most of the time. Like it, they're just distracted, and so they're going to take that penalty, the negative five penalty there. I don't also say too that like, so you have like a melee going on, and a character wants to or monster wants to like stealth around. I consider all those people in the melee to be distracted against the sneaking character. Because you're worried about the guy swinging a sword right in front of you or an, or an axe. You're not, the guy skulking off the side, they're so far off in your periphery that you're not going to be paying attention. Or, you you know, like, or I would say maybe the person swinging has an advantage at that point. Because cause th they should be paying attention to the guy that's striking at them. I, I would, or I or would, monster. I would agree. So, yeah. but that's, that's prime, that's uh, exclusively for passive perception. Because if you're, if you're making a roll, then you're actually looking. But that you know. So that being said, isn't isn't perception checks actually an action though? Like, if you're going to make a perception check, isn't that an action? I'm, I'm not entirely well, I think, sure. I think that would generally fit fall into the free interact action. interact with an object. So you're, I mean, you're kind of searching, so it is kind of an action. So I mean, if you're walking at half pace and you're specifically paying attention to everything around you, then yes, you're walking slower. You have the ability to see more, and that's why you don't suffer the minus five. So I think if you're using distraction pace. And lighting, you could add like fifteen to the to the difficulty for passive perception, and that puts that takes your high check of a fifteen up to the nearly impossible of a thirty. Yeah. Well, I also just don't like the way passive perception works because it makes me think of Baldur's Gate and like when you pass a trap when you your road with your high perception passes a trap and you spotted that. It's trap. like the Batman games where you have the detective mode where, you have, where everything lights up. Well, so I mean, this wasn't as sophisticated. Baldur's Gate one was, the, uh, and I think I played and I played Baldur's Gate two, but like where the trap would appear outlined in red. Right. Yeah. You know? Like, and it just seems like. It seems too video gamey for me the way that it functions. So I was thinking the idea of um, if of if their passive perception is high enough to notice it, they get a roll. Uh, so you just call for a roll because there's tension in that. Like they don't know what they're rolling for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so or you could say you have you know could you give me a perception check or you could have all their the players' perceptions written down and then you just call for a roll and tell them give have them give you the result. Um, so you could do that as well. And they, they don't necessarily know what they're rolling for, but they're probably thinking there's consequences to that mm -hmm. roll. So there's, there's like tension in that. And so they could obviously do better than that baseline 10 of a passive perception. But there's that 
45 percent <laughs> chance or less that they do worse and they are going to blunder into the into the the difficulty that you put there for them the hazard or the trap well that being said though the, the player put those resources to, to have that skill have that perception or whatever so if they're putting them there it's not going somewhere else mm -hmm. so you know so I don't know if it always if there always has to be a counter for what they did. And going back to what you said about how it feels video gamey, how many times have you read a book, novel, there's a story, a movie, TV series, whatever, where one of the characters grabs the other character before they step on the, you know, the tripwire or the booby trap, or, or they step on the mine and then the other Wait. character really is, don't, yeah, don't, don't move. move. <laughs> it, it, you know, and... and you know, even if someone was you know so skilled that they're like, oh my god, you just stepped on them. You know, you stepped on something. Don't move, and they they figure it out. But you know, if they don't have those other skills to get you off the mine, mm -hmm. you know, it's gonna it's gonna go off. And which is, speaks more to a higher level investment from that player into that that skill set. Right, and to have those those type of situations, um, like it's it's it takes a particular character to have. High, high skills in investigation, which is off of intelligence, perception, which is off of wisdom, thieves' tools, which is off of dexterity. So have having three skills that you're having expertise in, proficient in, and the decent stats to, to make it, that requires a certain character build. And really, if that's what you're going to do, allow them to do it and just... You're Let not by having them roll. You're not depriving them of anything. Yeah, like like they still have their numerical bonuses. You're just throwing some randomness into it. But if you're if you're having a character that has already put the points into the system that says, well, there's this, or yeah, you know, or even more so, if they take like the observation feat, you allow feats in your game. They or they took the observant feat, and you allow feats in your games that specifically affects the passive. The passive. Well, Ryan was saying off camera that if he's going to require that role, he'd want to give them that extra five. To give them because, that plus five because yeah. they took that feat. So, and it is like you're still saying that it's something that they they're noticing kind of out of the corner of their eye and their periphery. So, um, so that makes sense to me that like, yeah, in those sort of observant moments, you'd, you'd get that bonus. And, well, here's the other thing too. We always have to remember why they went to the passive scores anyway. And that was to slow, to, to essentially speed up the game. Speed up the game. And what happens once you ask a player, play a player for a role? Instantly they start metagaming. They know. Mm. They know something's so, up. Yeah, or you, the DM has to roll for them. Yeah. Well, that just happens. Like, any time something arriving toward an encounter is going to happen, like, the, the, the tempo of the game, the, the tenor of the game changes anyway. Yes. So, really, like, yeah, the first moment any player has to roll for anything, the game changes because now the many people are, some people are better than others about reining in metagaming uh, ideas and knowledge. But, some people that's going to slip in regardless of what's going on, whether that's a perception check or something else. Right. Um, well, I, I disagree because passive perception says that there was no role involved. We used a hard number, and your hard number failed, so the thing happens, or you discover, or you make the discovery. And discovery doesn't have to be a trap. Um, it could be um, oh, you notice some markings on the wall to your left. Right. Yeah. It, you, it invites the problem of like. Oh, I really, as a GM or as a DM, I really want them to fail this role. I know exactly what their passive perception is because I have an awareness of what their character sheet is. So I just make it one or two points above, you know, <laughs> what they could possibly attain. Or I set the circumstances that unless they did every single thing that they could possibly do to observe this thing, this is just going to happen. So it's like it almost becomes deterministic. Like the idea of, I'm hardlining, like, by fate, by decree, as GM, making sure that circumstances are such that I'm going to get them on this. Whereas, like, the dice create invite chance. Well, if you, I don't know the page, but if you open to the DMG, to the trap section, it goes, okay, this trap is, you know, easy, medium, hard, deadly. Um, you mean the damage by level? Da yeah. It There's actually, and also a great handy table on, um, if you have the... Um, the DM screen, it, that damage by level there is a fantastic But then resource. it also gives, you know, the difficulty levels, right? And, huh. you know, really, if you if you decide this is hard, there's a number for that. It's mm -hmm. I think it's 20. 
Yeah. You know, moderate is 15. You know, you're right. You can set it a point above or below or whatever the player has. And, like, as a GM, like, I, I mean, if you need a random die roll not to do that stuff to your players, there's bigger issues going on, and you're going to do other things anyway. <laughs> you know? But if, if there's a system there for you to go, what you know, how difficult is this check supposed to be? Mm. And you and you use those guidelines, it's not a problem. And go, oh well, you know, they always make difficult. Uh, they always make the difficult uh, passive perception because that's what their passive perception is. Um, or they always make it if you know, as long as they're taking their time, or you know, it's a well lit area and they have you know have that resources available to so they, so they can see well. Uh, but if you're, you know, but if your rogue is always up front of the party scouting, you know, and they're probably in, they're probably always taking a uh, plus ten to the DC, unless they're moving in half speed, or um, well, and here's a th the interesting thing too is like for light sources, like if you have dark vision, that mitigates that penalty, right? No, no, no. that you're you're considered dim light minus five. Mm. They I said actually I think they incorporated like you can see well enough to function but everything is always dim light mm. so you still need a light source. Well, yeah, that's an interesting sort of thing. And then also too, um, when I think about group perception checks and non ambush monsters, but mm. monsters that are going to be doing an ambush, right? Like. If you're letting everyone at the table make a perception roll and you have four to six players, the odds of somebody rolling above a 15 are pretty damn high. Like, it's like it's just very likely to happen. So, if you do your perception in such a way that, like, if one person notices, they can alert everyone, and you're, you're getting the drop on monster doesn't get the drop, I, like to th I think I like to think of perception as that split second before shit goes down. So, you're one character isn't surprised yeah that's fine but everybody else is just like oh shit like both, that's right. they, you know it's just like the the jump scare moments in a horror movie or something like that like you're that level of like off -put well, i will say so the way i would handle that though yeah. is okay the you nobody the monster knows they're there the one character knows the monsters there initiative between them yeah if the character beats the monster in initiative he could warn the rest of the party i think that would be th accurate and they'd have a split second to not be surprised yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But, I mean, it, it all depends upon what you're looking for with the surprise. Is this a situation where you're trying to use, like, an assassin's ability where it requires the surprise? Or are you looking that it's like, well, well I just want my, my monster to go first. Well, don't let the monster go first. Like, well, like, like, I don't know. It's not third edition where we have the, the, the surprise round negates your decks to AC because you're not dodging. But it is significant if that NPC is an assassin. Well, you know, yeah. That, that really matters. Unless you're falling into that specific situation, does it matter? Well, I, yes and no. Like, it, it might and it might not. It depends on what the exact circumstance... Because... Uh, fucking... <laughs> actually, look at uh, the Minds of Found Delver, Delver box set. Like that goblin encounter, if the goblin and the goblins get a, a surprise on the uh, a surprise round on the party, generally, mm -hmm. because goblins are sneaky as shit, and it's a first level party, and also they're pre gens, so they might not be uh, spec'd out right. to, to do that. Th that 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 encounter can kill a party. <laughs> like that that goblin encounter could absolutely kill the party. So the the monsters going first absolutely matters. Like I obviously wouldn't want to set a, a, an encounter to kill the party. But to make the encounter a challenging one, mm -hmm. uh, maybe that would be the case. So right. I think in the, in that instance, it, it does it, it does really matter. Well, you could do something interesting too, where you know maybe you give the monsters advantage on initiative mm. because uh, against the rest of the party, like yeah, right. like almost like they have a they have the default initiative say of whatever they rolled against the player that's aware of them but they but they lost so you so the rest of the party go well you know what you guys get an initiative against them but the mo I'm going to roll a second initiative for the monster with advantage and you know just to see if, if if it beats any of the other players so they will act before any of the players that it beats Hmm. So it's almost. I mean, it might be a level of complexity that you don't want in the game. Yeah. Uh, but, but for for those those dire situations where you think it's going to make a big difference, you can stack the order that way. So like, okay, the player that 
noticed and one on initiative, well, he's going to go first. And part of his action is to shout out. We then figure out what else you're going to do. Let's resolve the rest of the initiative and see how it's going to go between the players and the monster with initiative or with with advantage so he he rolls he takes his higher number and then we begin to populate the rest of the initiative we figure out the order okay you the player who noticed finish your action yeah see now that's very complicated part you know although i i think that would actually like that's three dice rolls that can be resolved pretty quickly really at the table like it takes longer to explain it to actually execute on that i agree that's so. true, but me personally as a GM, I'd be like, oh, you beat the monster on initiative that was trying to sneak up on the party? Okay, you can warn them as part of your action. Mm. You know, I don't you know, I don't think it's a big deal. Again, but every I, GM has to run well, the game how they want to. I, I so. mean, I think it, it matters because, like... Because you want to screw your players? For encounter, for, for encounter balance... Yeah, because I don't want to screw my players. Uh, for, for encounter balance, like, so... If you think it's very likely that the monster is going to get a dr- get the drop on the party, that's a significant more of a threat, right? So maybe your monster is a little weaker. Whereas, if um, if it's likely that the majority of your party is going to get to act in that opening volley, that opening round, now you want your that monster to have a little more staying power because it's not going to inflict as much damage. And the party's going to get to, to, to act on it, so you want it to be around to still manage to be some sort of well, threat to that, the party. That's just going to come down to how much do you feel... You love feel, your monsters? How well, much how, you love well, no, I was saying how, how much you feel that combat is, is the... the is important to the game. I know I've thrown monsters out there that I expected to be a challenge, and they got their asses kicked, and I'm like, well, that didn't go as planned. How much did your players complain about that? They didn't. Exactly. It doesn't matter. So, like, so what? Your monster was a pushover and you thought it was going to be tough. It happens all the time. And sometimes I do an encounter and go, oh, they almost died. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and that, that can happen if, if you don't... If, 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 if the dice go in the favor of your monster and not in the favor of your players, it's going to have over the course of a game that, that, that swing. That wait, wait, th- those are the swings of balances where you're like... I want to push them a little bit in this encounter, but I don't want to mis- miscalculate enough that I TPK the party. <laughs> well, so then it comes down to as the GM, you have to learn to let go of control because you know what? Sometimes you have a plan. Sometimes party members die. Yeah, well, that, but going both ways, like you have a plan for that encounter, but just because you're... Your your players played a certain way, or luck was on their side. Whatever it, your your difficult encounter that you wanted was a pushover for them. You know, you get you get them on the next one. Maybe the, the hard the hardest thing is if it if it swings the other way, and you annihilate the party. Well, now you just have to try and figure out. Well, how do I keep the campaign moving? How do I rectify the situation? Are the dead players have the ability to come back to life? Do they just have to roll up new characters? You know, you you have to figure that out. Right then and there, um, you know. All right, is there a wandering NPC that might be able to lend assistance? Is, can the party actually mitigate their issues with what they actually have? No, on them? you have a character sheet funeral where you like you put them all into a folder and then you dig a, a little hole in the backyard <laughs> and put the character sheets in there, no, no, buried pirates. over. Somebody's playing taps in the background. Pyres. Your surviving players just wish they had a lower perception so that they they didn't have to witness the carnage. Yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> so oh, since, the horror. Since we're way off topic now at this point, let's ask you guys. What do you think about perception in D&D? Uh, how do you handle passive perception? Is it perfect the way it is? Uh, do you always forget about those pesky uh, disadvantages to passive uh, perception? Let us know in the comments below. While you're at it, like, share, and subscribe. You can check us out on Nerdarchy.com. Or you can also get some sweet Nerdarchy swag over on Nerdarchy.com. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.